our technology partner, Credit to Be. I'm Justin Warden, the marketing coordinator for Credit to Be, and I'm joined today by Ken Frisco, the operating board director of the Federation of Credit, as well as Lloyd Sarakin of the law offices of Lloyd B. Sarakin LLC, who will be presenting today on Know Your Customer and Anti-Money Laundering Compliance. Uh, just a few quick things to get out of the way before we begin. If you do have any questions throughout the course of the presentation, you can feel free to type those into either the chat or questions box on your side panel, and we'll take all those questions and put them into a Q&A at the end of the presentation. Uh, we also have the, uh, the ability now that you're able to get a copy of the slides in real time. Those will be under the handout section on your side panel, so you're able to feel free to open those up and take notes along with uh, the presentation as it goes along. Uh, the last thing that we have is when you exit the webinar, there's going to be a very brief survey that will pop up. Uh, it takes about 30 seconds to fill out, but it gives us a lot of great insight into how we can continue to make these webinars better for you. So with that, I'm going to pass it over to Ken and let him give you an introduction of Lloyd. Thank you, Justin. Good afternoon. I'd just like to give you a little bit of background on uh, Lloyd Sarakin. He's recently formed his own firm in 2015, the Law Offices of Lloyd B. Sarakin, LLC, providing legal services and counseling to corporations in the areas of creditors' rights, bankruptcy, contract review and negotiation, anti-money laundering compliance, as well as offering general counsel services on, on, as an, on, the, on an as-needed basis. Previously, Lloyd was a partner in the firm of Henderson, Cave Lee, Pum, and Charney and provided credit bankruptcy and creditors' rights counseling to his clients before he decided to open his own practice. Prior to that, Lloyd was a member of the legal department at Sony Electronics in Park Ridge for 26 years. As Vice President and Associate General Counsel, Lloyd was in charge of all credit, financial, and bankruptcy matters in the United States. I'll turn the webinar presentation over now to Lloyd. Okay, uh, thank you all for having me today. Uh, privileged to be able to speak to everyone. Uh, here in the room and uh, on the uh, webinar. What I thought I would uh, try to accomplish today is to integrate some of the various moving parts um, with money laundering, anti-money laundering, um, uh, to trade-based companies. So you can sort of integrate all these facets together. There's a lot of different um, areas and parts to a, a good anti-money laundering compliance program. So again, thanks for having me, and um, feel free um, to send in questions. If you don't get uh, your questions answered today, and you have other questions, you feel free to email me. Uh, my contact information, I think, is available in the materials, um, but I'd be more than happy to answer anything that's not uh, answered today. Right, first of all, I. Um, just, I guess, for the people in the room, I, I wanted to get an idea. Do, do all the companies pretty much have anti-money laundering policies and procedures that you operate with, or uh, are you familiar with know your customer policies? <laughs> okay. But, it, but so it encompasses anti-money laundering. Okay. So I'm going to assume that's generally you know, the, the, uh, the background of most of the credit managers here. Okay, so um, we'll go from there. Um, basically, to start, what is money laundering? It's the process of disguising the existence, the legal application or, or legal source of income or money. So it looks like it came from legal sources. Um, generally, over the years, uh, it, it's changed um, because of banking regulations and crackdowns. The way money is laundered has gone through many different iterations. So a few years ago, the most common was, and the, and the big example that was given was illegal uh, drugs. And those proceeds, which were, you know, all cash, had to be put into the financial system. And although drugs was a major part of it, it really encompassed any type of crime. Uh, it could be anything. But the big issue is taking all of that cash that obviously can't be declared. It used to be able to have been deposited into banks. 
bank regulations cracked down over the years. Then they had, you know, they had like ten thousand dollar limitation to 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 clean those, you know, money laundering and and what we're going to be talking about um, lately. The government got more involved because uh, a lot of the uh, criminal activities turned into uh, terrorist financing. So now. Just in addition to having funding sources for a lot of the terrorism that's been going on around the world. So now it's a safety issue. It's much more, you know, top line, uh, you know, top of mind uh, topic, right? Uh, next slide. Um, so money laundering occurs in three stages. There's placement generally. There's placement where the cash is introduced into the financial system deposited into banks. There's layering, which tries to disguise that cash. So there's a lot of uh, complex transactions, movement from one bank to another, from one account to a different account. It helps disguise where the funds are and, and the origin of those funds. And then finally, integration, where those funds are integrated into the mainstream U.S. economy, where it doesn't look like uh, they look legitimate. It doesn't look like they came from any illegal source. Um, the placement basically is done through, it's called uh, smurfing. And smurfing, if anyone remembers, there was a little cartoon with the blue characters running around these little smurfs. Well, originally it started where the money launderer would hire many hundreds of people because when the banks crack down on uh, having not allowing large deposits of cash without filling out forms, they would hire people, give them increments of cash, $3,000 or less, and these people would then go several times a day to several banks and put small amounts of cash deposited into, into these accounts that were set up. So it wouldn't trigger anything that came from. Um, money laundering, again, can occur through several sources. It can be put into the banking system directly, which is what we're talking about with Smurfs, you know, putting money into what could be a legitimate account, and then that money is used to, to buy goods um, or carry out illicit activities. Um, there's money service businesses, money transmitters, check cashers, currency exchanges, lately stored value cards, where funds can be put onto, you know, these uh, procedures, the, these areas to, to make those funds look legitimate. And then those, for instance, stored value cards can be used online to purchase merchandise, to send funds overseas, and that's how money is, is moved around. Um, same thing with lately the online payment systems, Bitcoin, PayPal, um, you know, a, a lot of those, I think especially Bitcoin, they don't ask a lot of questions now. You can refur refurbish these things and just buy this online currency. There's not a lot of tracing of that that goes on. The government hasn't really required um, those operators to, to do a lot of reporting. So people, you know, who have illicit funds, they'll use those methods as a way to, to avoid, you know, tracing the origin of the funds and to then pay for goods with it. Um, there's informal value systems that have popped up around the world where it's based basically on trust. So you carry out some activity for me and these brokers will then uh, use use the funds, get funds, and have someone else uh, carry out illegal activity for someone else, and they'll do a currency exchange. But it's basically a, a trust based. Well, if the person doesn't do their end of the bargain, what happens? You know, it's trust based because these guys are, you know, I mean, they'll they'll kill you 
if, if you don't do what you're supposed to do. So it, that goes on in certain areas of the world with, um, you know, different gangs. And then, uh, again, used to be much more prevalent, a little bit less now, but bulk cash smuggling, where they have, have to actually smuggle cash out of the country if there's illegal drug sales in the U.S. Maybe, you know, the drugs came from Colombia, and they have to now get the cash back out, back to Colombia. It used to be, I'll say, relatively easy to smuggle the cash, but now it's very difficult. You go through screening at the airports, they'll pick that up, you know, very easily. So that became, you know, much more difficult. And just to, a note on cash smuggling, a, 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 a note, a, a piece of currency, a $20 bill, weighs one gram, okay? There's 454 grams in a pound. A million dollars in 20s weighs 100 pounds. So a million dollars in 20s basically is three foot high stacks of currency six deep, all right? So it's, you know, a big, big packet. So you can't put a million dollars in 20s in a suitcase. It probably takes, you know, four or five suitcases. There's no way you're getting that out of the country in this day and age, you know. So again, that you know, smugglers have had to look for alternative means. Um, and then, of course, trade-based transactions, uh, why we're all here today, and because of the crackdown in banking regulation and the tough um, going with cash smuggling, the criminals have now looked to trade-based transactions over the last bunch of years. And trade-based, we're going to, this is going to be the subject of what we're talking about going forward now, it's basically to take all that illicit money and if we can buy legitimate goods with it, now you have a currency that you could deal with. So a lot of, in the beginning, a lot of this took place with electronics companies where the relative size of the piece of electronics was relatively small compared with the worth. You know, so Walkmans or chips or, you know, small, you know, cell phones, things like that where their size is relatively small, the value is relatively high, they could buy these things in bulk, ship them out of the country, you know, uh, there's different schemes for it we'll get into, and then that itself is is currency, and they can and they pay for that with these illicit funds. So that's that's our concern here, and that's what we're going to you know try to talk about and, and give um, some good suggestions on how to combat that. Uh, okay, um, so let's talk. So as far as trade-based money laundering, the classic situation that. Ha happened with is called the black market peso exchange and that basically stemmed from the drug trade out of Colombia where uh, the Colombian drug cartels would send drugs into the country they'd be sold here now you have piles of cash currency that's in the US with the drug dealers and they have to get that cash or the value back to the uh, to the uh, drug traders in Colombia, all right? So that's one method, um, and we'll get into how they do that in a minute. Um, then there's over and under invoicing, where an importer in the U.S. would either pay more if, if it's an over invoice situation, and if they're paying more to the um, Colombian or, or non-U.S. entity, they're moving more funds out of the country because they're overpaying. So it's a way to send more value outside the country. Or it can happen the other way where the importer, um, if they're under invoiced for the goods, right, they'll keep more value here, which can be used in other ways, right? So it's a way to get money and value into the U.S., into the wrong hands. And then finally, um, purchasing precious commodities um, with those funds. And that's situations here, examples um, would be 
uh, car dealers, uh, jewelry, precious metals, um, where, again, the, not in the case of cars, but, you know, you have drug dealers going in with $100,000 to buy a Ferrari, you know, something like that. But the government got smart and cracked down on that. So there's special rules now for jewelers, for car dealers, where they have suspicious activity forms to fill out. They have cash reporting forms to fill out. So you can't go in now to a, a business, a retail business, and purchase these things with cash without something being reported. So that's a little more difficult. Um, next slide. So this is just a chart of the black market peso exchange. Um, and basically what you have is, so you have, let's say, and we're using just, you know, a drug dealer situation as an example. But, you know, come out of Colombia, they sell the drugs here in the U.S. market. Um, you get a peso broker who would basically take the cartel dollars, all right, in exchange for the Colombian pesos. The brokers in the U.S. didn't those dollars placed into the U.S. banking system, and that's where I talked about before, you know, the Smurfs, where that money actually has to get deposited in a bank. Once it's deposited in a bank, then you could do, they could do different things. The, the black market peso exchange, what they did was the peso broker would give those dollars to a Colombian importer who would buy goods from a U.S. manufacturer with those dollars, and then the drug, the um, peso broker would give the value of that back to the um, to, to the Colombian. So the Colombian drug dealer would get paid, all right? He'd get his money, or his, his money's worth, because he could buy goods with, with that money, and the money would stay in the country. It would stay in the U.S. It wouldn't have to be smuggled out, because they're buying goods from the importer. With, with those funds. So it was a neat way to get around actually having to smuggle the cash out. There was another side benefit of that. And that's, in Colombia's case, the, if you were doing legitimate business, the Colombian duties and taxes added up, I think it was like 60% or more of the value of the goods. So by doing this illegally and trying to avoid the import duties, the importer avoids all that stuff. right? They so they're saving 60% on that. So it was sort of a win-win, and it, it that generated a lot of a lot of business <laughs> that way. Um, what happened was the U.S. government actually this was back I think in the early 2000s was trying to put pressure on the Colombian government to decrease the duties and taxes because that was driving the system by how much extra, you know, the, a legitimate Colombian business would, would be paying. And Colombia didn't want to do that, so the system kept going. And to this day, it's still a pretty popular way of doing business. And again, going back to your trade-based companies, this is a kind of what you have to watch out for is you're selling goods, right? And it's being paid for by some source you're not, you don't really know, all right? So it could be, let's say you have company ABC, they're a legitimate customer or semi-legitimate customer, and all of a sudden you may get a check from an unknown source, theoretically, to pay the invoices of, the, of that company. And that, you don't want to do that. Third-party payment, you don't know where the source is. It could come from a peso broker who made a deal with the company, and they're, they're paying their bills with the dirty funds. So that's, this is what watch out for and why you know you're so important. But if the so person important. wrote the piece, it's really not something you have to be crazy about. Right. Although, and we'll come back to it in the answer to that, you know, you have to customer. So even though it's a legitimate customer today, and if their finances look right, 
and their balance sheet doesn't look right, all of a sudden they're able to pay a million dollar invoice, okay, that should set off some red flags. Okay, so with that proviso, yes, you're right. Do these wires of funds to that company yeah. in Columbia and they turn to you under their... Right. In other words, what do you mean? You mean the Colombian company yeah. paying or the U.S.? Yeah, if, you were, mm -hmm. if you go back to the previous yeah. slide, if Peso Broker, right. rather than just paying the, you know, for right. the goods directly, yeah. you could send that money back to the to the, to the U.S. Order. company, right? No, no, to the Colombian order, wire it, and then he would in turn be sending that money. Granted, he wouldn't get the tax benefit, but the tariff, whatever. Right. Benefit, he could. It would avoid suspicion because now that it would direct from the company and then a third party do that. But keep in mind, banks have relations now very tight strict regulations, so if a wire comes in or goes out to an account, banks need to monitor that. All right, so it would be caught that So, theoretically, it, would be supposed to be, it should be caught by the bank, right? Okay. Uh, all right, so, and then another typical scheme, is they're sort of related, and there's many different iterations, but this would be where a criminal could set up a front company all right, so you have your retail company, you have customer A, all right, but now, as I said before, you know who's funding your customer, yeah. all right? Again, it could be legitimate, but it doesn't necessarily have to be legitimate. So the criminal could set up what might look like a legitimate company, but he's really funding that with, with illicit funds. And that's why, you know, you as your, the credit department, you're looking at financials, you're knowing the customer, you have to see that it makes sense. They've been around for a while, and not just being funded by by criminal proceeds. All right? So this can happen two ways. One is a criminal sets up this, this company to theoretically sell legitimate products to legitimate companies. They're buying your products with, with legal funds. Or that what sometimes could happen is they'll make a deal with a legitimate customer, with a business that's been around for 20 years. And they'll say, hey, you want to make extra, you know, 20% on your money? Uh, here, I'm going to give you money, you're going to pay your invoices, and I'll give you, you know, 20% off of it for doing this for us. So, you know, and you would never know. As a, you know, legitimate manufacturer, you may not know that. So it becomes important to keep tabs on who your customers are. Okay, next. All right, so now just, again, sort of tying in some of the different areas here. So to look at the, a quick view of the laws behind this, so you have the Money Laundering Control Act of 1986. There's two sections, 56 and 57, that are most are applicable. And basically what these do is they give uh, structuring, Money Laundering Control Act, criminalizes money laundering, and the act defines that as conducting or attempting to conduct a financial transaction where property derived from unlawful, unlawful activity for the purpose of concealing or disguising the source. The law criminalizes structuring or attempting to structure the financial transaction to avoid the reporting requirement. In addition, it makes it knowingly uh, a crime to engage in a monetary, monetary transaction uh, with property greater than $10,000. So, um, and then, uh, let's see, the other areas are um, transporting funds into or out of the U.S. or conducting a financial transaction with funds that are represented to be the proceeds of a crime. That's what's called the sting provision. That's the, the last on your list there. But that's basically for the purpose for the government to literally conduct the sting operation, but ha have it not be illegal when they do that as a setup. So this allows the government to conduct these sting operations. Um, the, the, one of the important things here to note is the structuring. So 
if you have a customer and you know you're basically telling them, oh, we can't accept you know more than ten thousand dollars in in a cash or cash equivalent, and they say, well, well, what can we do to get this transaction done? Oh, well, you can if you send me a company check for this amount and you give the rest on a credit card, and you, you know you're basically helping the thief structure the transaction to get around the money laws, money laundering laws. So your company and you, you're going to be liable, okay, for basic accessory, you know, to, to help that transaction. So that's specifically, you know, covered in the laws. But you're going to have things like that where you're going to have that they, look, this is a credit line I'll give you, and you either have to pay it in a check, right. I'll let you use a credit card to pay the difference. So, so, you know, so it's a little bit of a fine line. Mm -hmm. You're right. And everything is in black and white, and one of the great so we'll get on, you know, I'll talk about what you can maybe do, but you should be, you know, basically, I'll cover it later, but basically saying to them, you know, if they say something, I can't discuss it. I can't discuss it pursuant to the money laundering laws, okay? That's all I could tell you. So you're not going to be, and make sure you document it. Right. All right? So at least there, you can't be accused right. of, you this of is your helping them. Yeah. Right. Okay? Um, and basically, if a transaction is suspicious or looks suspicious, you can't accept payment, all right, or cash from a third party. Uh, you cannot instruct or discuss at all with the customer how to structure the transaction. So that's really the bottom line. But if you have an order, this would make this. I know we'll get to that later. <laughs> yeah. What do you mean? So if you have an order that they order, 10,000 units and it's right. 25 bucks, then that's a legitimate order. So right. if you're doing something that's not on the Correct. business. Correct. Correct. And so if they only have so much of a credit line, you have to help them structure that to make the sale. You can structure how they can pay for it from a credit point of view. Yes. But you have to be careful. You don't cross the line saying, like, what forms of payment can you make? So, for instance, oh. if there's a $10,000 cash reporting requirement and the customer wanted to pay for pay in cash, you can't say, well, you know, if you, so you, you say, well, if you pay in $10,000, uh, we're going to have to fill out a, what's called a Form 8300. Yeah. Uh, customers, oh, I don't want to do that. How can I avoid that? Well, if you give me, oh, okay. if you yeah, give me a company check for 5000 and you give a money order, right. then we won't have to fill out the form. Okay. That's what you want to avoid. All right? Um, so the, and then the other part of the law, uh, which I mentioned in 1957, basically makes it a crime uh, to conduct business with funds derived from a specified unlawful activity for over $10,000. And here what's important, intent is not required. Okay, so they, if the company's being prosecuted, they don't have to prove that you had intent to do this. It's um, it also creates long-arm jurisdiction over foreign individuals and entities. Basically, if any funds start from the U.S., go through the U.S., or end up in the United States, the government has jurisdiction over the transaction and over the parties. All right? <clears throat> so, you know, a lot of transactions work that way. <laughs> So basically, the government has jurisdiction over almost every transaction. Um, and it applies to criminals who launder their funds and persons and, or entities that knowingly participate in those transactions. And we'll talk about what, what knowingly is. I don't know if you can all, uh, see it, but, you know, I put some, uh, there's some red type throughout the presentation. What I try to do is put in red anywhere where knowingly or know your customer is important uh, for you and your companies, just to stress that. So you'll see it throughout the presentation. Uh, next. Then you have, um, in, in light of the terrorist attacks and um, 2001, the USA Patriot Act was created. It went through Congress in 45 days. It was the quickest piece of legislation ever, ever done. And again, it had a lot of <clears throat> uh, money laundering uh, regulations and hoops to jump through. What it did gave law enforcement the authority 
uh, of expanded powers, investigative tools. They could seize the property, and and I don't only mean the thieves' property. If if your company was paid from these illegal funds, they could seize those funds, whether you really knew about it or you didn't know about it. Um, it helped um, obtain information and about financial uh, transactions. So here, banks had to comply a lot more, and there was a lot more reporting to the government. It facilitated identification of terrorist financing and supporters, and it helped prosecute foreign persons who were involved in money laundering by giving them jurisdiction in the U.S. Um, just as an aside, the USA Patriot Act actually stands for something. I don't know who came up with this mnemonic, but in case you're interested, I wrote it down. It's uniting and strengthening America by providing appropriate tools required to intercept and obstruct terrorists. So literally, that's USA Patriot. <laughs> okay. So I would never remember that if I didn't <laughs> write it down. Um, next, yeah. So. And the fines here and the penalties are really hefty. It's a $10 million, up to $10 million fine, 250000 per incident. Um, there's civil penalties for corporations. There's losses because your transactions might be blocked. And there's actual prison sentences um, for individuals. So as credit managers or having you know oversight on a credit function, if they feel you knowingly allowed something to happen, there's individual liability here, uh, up to 10 years in prison. Um, so that's probably one of the most important things, I guess, you, you're going to hear here today. It's liability for the corporation and the individual. Um, and the company can be held criminally or civilly liable for the actions of its offices and employees. Um, next slide. Um, in addition to all this, again, I mentioned before, funds can be seized. So if those funds can be traced to specified unlawful activities, you're going to, the company is going to forfeit those uh, funds. And specified unlawful activity, the list of those, they're basically they're called predicate crimes. The list, I don't know, it's hundreds of crimes. So what I always said when I was counseling companies is just assume whatever illegal activity it is on that list and is a specified unlawful activity because it really covers everything. I mean, it would be hard pressed to find some crime that's not going to be listed there. So just assume it's anything. All right. Um, next. Oh, one of the things, just um, going back two seconds. Because this money can be seized, and I don't even think I put it in the recommendation, but it's occurred to me. What we did sometimes when I was in Sony is um, a lot of companies have um, sweep accounts. major general big bank account because if God forbid anything were to happen with that account it wouldn't be commingled with all of the uh, funds so it may be something worth considering if you want to do that if you have a sort of different area of business you know to think about okay. um, with the seizure of funds there's really only one defense that you can assert and it's the innocent owner defense and basically it's that you were reasonably without cause to believe the property was subject to forfeiture or, you know, illegal. Um, and when reasonably without cause to believe basically means you didn't know, you didn't have reason to know, all right, and you were a totally innocent owner. Um, 
even if you were this fight and and there's been a lot of companies with experience here where they have to try to fight this government forfeiture action. It's very, very expensive. It takes years and years to get these funds free. The attorney's fees are costly. Um, and again, your company would be in the newspaper and it's not good press. Even if at the end of the day you, you show you were innocent. So it's something to watch out for. Um, yeah. This is the actual law regarding the forfeiture. It's 18 U.S. Code Section 981. Basically, any funds that were involved in any money laundering transaction or traceable can be subject to civil forfeiture. All right, so that's just where the law is. Um, knowledge that money is derived from illegal activity can be shown by being willfully blind. And you're going to hear this concept time and time again. Basically, it's not whether you actually knew, but it's whether you should have known. So you have to take affirmative action. So you're not going to be considered, your company is not going to be considered willfully blind, you know, turning a blind eye to the transaction. Right, it's basically you know, that you avoided knowledge of facts indicating money came from illegal activity where you were on notice of suspicious facts or you had red flags you should have looked at and you deliberately failed to ask the next question. You know, what you should have asked or what you should have investigated. Uh, yeah, I don't want to ask that question. I'm scared of the answer. Let's just do the transaction. That's going to be willfully blind. Your company will be tagged for that. Okay, and this is really the crux of the whole presentation here, all right? Know your customer, all right? Knowledge can be imputed by not doing something affirmatively, all right? And this is the biggest concern for trade-based companies. Next. Um, in addition to the money laundering laws we talked about, I touched on this. This is just cash reporting. This is sort of an aside. It's a little off topic. But just know that, and your companies are probably aware of it already, you know, transactions where you receive cash or cash equivalent, which could be money orders, traveler's checks, bank checks, cashier's checks, all right? If a combination of those or one of them is over 10,000, there's a requirement to fill out Form 8300. And if you have your treasury departments uh, are probably aware of it and that they have a duty to uh, fill those out and report. <laughs> okay. Uh, next. Um, as far as reducing fines, so, so what can we do? Most companies will have policies and procedures they set up to try to um, detect and stop any suspicious or illegal activity. And the U.S. sentencing guidelines have been set up where if a company happens to get caught up in this, um, you know, not even necessarily uh, on purpose, voluntarily, you know, but they, they happen to be an unwitting uh, player in this because someone tried to use them, if certain factors are kept by the company and adhered to, any sentence or fine can be reduced with these sentencing guidelines. And this is an example that generally what, what companies set up. So they'll have a corporate policy. And it doesn't only apply to money laundering. It could be any um, illegal activity. But I tried to give you what would typically be done for money laundering to reduce the fine. You'd have a corporate policy and procedure to specifically designed to identify and combat violations. You need to have training of employees, and it doesn't have to be every employee, but employees who would typically, um, you know, be touch points for either uh, credit control over a customer, dealing with the customer directly, receiving funds, you know, uh, controlling bank accounts, things like that. Internal controls where you have reasonable oversight and due diligence, a designation of a compliance officer, an audit function and a reporting function. So those are generally, if you have those in place and you follow them, um, it should help. 
if there's any problem down the road. Okay, um, and then another area is the uh, the OFAC list. The Office of Foreign Assets Control has um, set up a list of basically prohibited parties um, with who you can't do business with or you can't do certain business with or there's sanctions on. And they, and they, could, they stretch across all different lists. So there's uh, the terrorist list where literally terrorists who have been identified, you can't do business with them. Um, there's ships actually, actual ships listed that come from countries that are involved with terrorism or uh, other illicit activities that you can, <coughs> they're going to be on the list. Um, drug dealers, the Kingpin Act, people are on there. Um, politically uh, incorrect <laughs> persons where you'll have, you know, the head of a country who's involved in improper conduct, they could be on the list. So really what has to be done, and the law is, um, next slide, the law is it basically prohibits transactions with anyone on this list. So if you don't screen your customer or the transaction against this list and you happen to have a transaction with them, whether you know or don't know is irrelevant, the government can come in and take those funds and you would be violating law because you're dealing with someone on, on this list, right? It can involve sanctioned countries as well. So one way or another, you have to make sure you're not dealing with anyone that's contained on this so-called OFAC list. And by the same token, um, they block funds. So if you, if you happen to have a transaction with anyone on that list, the government can come right in and block the bank account to not let funds out, or if you have the funds, they'll block your bank account, your company's bank account, and you won't be able to um, release any of those funds. And again, it probably won't be just the funds from that transaction, it'll be the funds in whatever whatever's in that one account that they could say may be related to that uh, criminal activity. Um, okay, you can skip this. Okay, as far as screening now, um, when your company set up some sort of screening with this, and each company is different, but you have to look at several factors because the OFAC list is updated pretty frequently. It could change on a daily basis. It could change on an hourly basis. Um, it really depends. So what I like to suggest is, you know, put these things somewhere on your plate. You have to check when you have a transaction, you have to make sure you're going to capture anything new on the list when the OFAC list changes. You're going to have to capture a transaction when customer information changes. Maybe their address changes. Maybe the name changes. So you have to be able to capture that. Um, when a delivery address changes, or maybe there's a new drop ship, right? You don't know where that drop ship is going, right? So you need to the, you need to screen the name and or the address against the list. Or obviously, when you have a new customer, you have to make sure they're not on the list. And again, depending on the volume your company does, you know, it depends what's going to be cost effective. There are specialty companies out there, not even specialty, well known. D&B, um, Vastera, you know, Choice Point. There's a lot of companies that'll do this for you, you know, for a fee. Um, they could set it up automatically. You could do it manually. There's special software. But one way or another, you should have some sort of screening procedure in place to make sure, you know, you're bumping up. Yeah. That's probably another enhancement. Okay, so now let's go back to so knowledge and willful blindness, and I touched on this before. Knowledge has been interpreted as willful blindness, basically meaning a deliberate avoidance of the facts, of the knowledge of the facts. So a person or the company failed to ask questions, all right, that should have reasonably been asked. 
Um, you have to take affirmative steps not to become unwitting accomplices or participants. All right? So now that we know knowledge is important, we see knowledge doesn't have to be actual knowledge, but it can be implied. All right? And again, that's probably a very dangerous thing because the government can always say you should have known with all these facts out there and you didn't do anything about it. Um, next slide. Um, the, uh, another important thing with, with um, knowledge and willful blindness is as far as the company is concerned, in the government size, the company is one entity, all right? So, and this is where it becomes dangerous. If one person in your company knew something, let's say the credit department, you had some, you had some knowledge of something, the salesperson knew something else. And those individually may not add up to a red flag or suspicious activity, but if you put those two facts together, then like the bells go off a little bit, well the government is going to consider that knowledge. They're going to consider that collective knowledge by the company and you can be held responsible for that. So that's why as a company working together and, and the whole company knowing what's going on is very, very important because you have to add up all those pieces of information. How do you do that? One way um, that's been done in the past is to have like a steering committee or some sort of committee where, and again, I'll just talk about anti-money laundering, where maybe you have a credit representative, you know, on a committee, you have the salesperson on the committee, you have um, a few uh, top executives, okay? So you can discuss and make sure there's nothing floating around the company that the company isn't aware of, okay, individual pieces of information, all the information is there's some collaboration and, and the company's aware of what's going on, all right? All right, so we know your customer policy. That's one part of this program I was talking about that helps either, you know, stem illicit activity or if by chance the government decides to, you know, make some allegations against you, it can reduce any, any fines. All right, and it shows the company was doing some, the, the, the due diligence it was required to do. All right, so now let's talk about a little bit of what should be included in a know your customer policy or, or a form. And I've just sort of thrown these out. This isn't, you know, uh, you know, every factor that has to be on there, but it's really meant more to give you ideas of what you have on there or should have or if you don't have on your forms, okay? Um, and again, some of these suggestions, you, these are probably going to be duplicative of a lot of you, questions you'd be asking from a credit point of view, right? Um, so it's probably nothing new you're going to see that you're not already aware of. But, um, all right, so you know, obviously OFAC screen has to be performed one way or another. Determining the true identity of the customer, providing legal evidence of their status, um, learn about the types of transactions carried out. So if something looks not normal to this type of comp uh, company or business, it'll stick out and it'll give you a red flag. Uh, preparing and updating a description of the customer's operations, retail versus wholesale, anticipated volume. If, if the customer does some cash sales, it's a good idea to get a handle on that because obviously playing with the cash could be an issue. Um, and whether it's consistent with the type of business, does it make sense? Obviously, there's a lot of cash on their balance sheet or their income statement, but they're not doing that a cash type business that would obviously be a red flag. Okay. Um, all right. I, I don't think I'm going to go through this like all of these, um, but you can see these in the materials, all right? And, you know, investigating customers' background, um, 
information on the owners could be important, requesting, you know, verifying references. I'm going to sort of skip through some of these, but it's here in the materials. You'll be able to see it. Just getting a little short on time. Um, on a, a visual check of the customer's uh, business is good if you can do it. A lot of companies, you don't have the manpower um, to be able to do that for every customer, especially, you know, we used to take telephone sales. Obviously, you can't do that. But, you know, a larger customer, it's not, you know, a bad idea. The salespeople may be out there from time to time anyway, so that's good to have in your files to make, you know, to help that they're legitimate. Um, keep going, let's see. Um, trade area, we did that. Whether international transactions are expected. Again, payment's a big issue. Determining the source of funds. This is probably, you know, the big area where you could get into trouble the quickest with very little defenses. Where is that payment coming from? If it's not coming directly from the customer, from an account, a bank account that you know of and are aware of and matches who the customer told you they do banking with, that's, that could be a problem. That should be an automatic red flag. So third-party payments you have to be very careful with. Payments by the principal of a customer, that you have to watch that also. And you probably have to watch that from a credit point of view too because if the principal ends up filing bankruptcy just from a credit point of view, you know, that could be, you know, a, an improper payment and called back by his creditor. So you probably wouldn't want a lot of payments from the principal of the customer. Um, with, uh, coming from a legitimate bank, coming from a country that makes sense, and from your, uh, you know, customer's uh, bank account. Okay. Um, just a few additional notes on this. Um, generally, I say to maintain the records probably at least five years um, but it should be consistent with your company's record retention policy. You don't want to have a record retention policy in your company where it's keeping records for seven years and for some reason the know your customer forms, you know, aren't there and it's not seven years yet. That, that looks bad. It looks like you destroyed evidence. Um, periodic self-audits should be completed. Um, the form should be, the, I'm talking about the Know Your Customer form now, and it can be part of a credit application, okay, but the Know Your Customer part um, should be filled out by you, the company, not by the customer, and it should be signed and verified by someone within the company, so you have a rent and kept, all right? Um, some red flags that just over the years, you know, should trigger some further questions or just make you aware um, to sort of stop and look at the transaction again. Uh, and I, again, I give you a few examples. No interest in the details. They don't care about the details. They just want to pay the invoice, cleanse the money, and go on from there. Not willing to give information, not giving corporate identification or proof if you require it. Um, no business infrastructure, you try the phone number, there's no working phone, letterhead, um, unusual spikes in purchases, um, no good D&B history where they should have D&B, you know, financial reports look a little funny or unusual to the type of business it is. Um, Again, I'm not going to go through all these. We're short on time, but you'll see them, and you're probably already familiar with all of these from a credit point of view. Um, if the company does business in countries that uh, look a little strange, or they're known money laundering havens, so they have very few, uh, bank, you know, they have bank secrecy laws in effect. Um, Cook Islands, Nauru, Nigeria. Um, unnecessary third-party intermediaries. So why would a, we literally had a few occasions where they, they'd have, you know, an agent, they'd call like an agent, you know, in the middle of the transaction. Well, what do you need an agent for? You're a company, you're buying goods. Yeah. There was no legitimate reason for it. It was just sort of used to disguise the transaction. Oh, we need it for tax reasons. Well, that's not really an answer <laughs> or a legitimate answer. We're changing payment methods more frequently than you would think is, is reasonable, okay? What do you do when there's a red flag? And this is where structuring 
you know, comes in. You can request more information from, from the customer, request more documentation or supporting documentation, checking references, visit the business's location, request corrective action when, when concerns arise. Um, but here, I say confirm your customer will no longer pay with unrelated third-party checks. Again, be careful about structuring. You can say, sorry, our customer doesn't accept third-party payments. You can say that. You just can't, you know, say, you know, what to do yeah. <laughs> instead of that, all right? Um, and refuse to do business with uh, some potential customers who, you know, you're not comfortable with. <laughs> And again, that goes a long way with showing the government you're, you're serious about this. Keep, you know, document all your inquiries, keep records of it, and if you need to, if you need to go further, contact the legal counsel. Okay. Uh, let's get the next slide. Um, I just gave some payment policies. You may want to consider what might be acceptable forms of payment, what may be red flags, maybe consider not accepting these, third-party payments, multiple instruments, to pay a single invoice, obviously cash might be a concern. Um, if it's a credit card holder that's going to be paying, establish the relationship between the credit card holder and the customer. You know, what, you don't want some strange individual paying, paying the bills for the company. Um, okay, let's skip the next one. And consequences of failure, again, reputational damage is huge to your company. It takes years to reverse that. Seizure of money that your company had, forfeiture of the goods, is fines. Uh, if your company exports, you can lose your export license, especially uh, if you violate the OFAC uh, regulations. Criminal prosecution and tightening of import procedures at all the borders if you're getting your goods, your company's goods in, if they're being imported. Um, and basically, it's a, just as a closing, it's illegal for any person to knowingly engage in a financial transaction or an international transportation or transmission of funds from a specified criminal activity with the intent of promoting the criminal activity, concealing, disguising, the nature or origin, avoiding federal or state transactional reporting requirements, or evading taxes. There's no requirement for actual knowledge. It can be implied property involved in violation, and any property traceable to that property can be forfeited as well. Under the money laundering statutes, you can be held criminally liable if you're willfully blind to the source of funds. As a result, you must do due diligence and be sure you know your customer, all right? And then um, I just gave you three links to uh, useful sites um, for this. One is the Treasury Department site. There's the sanctions um, site under OFAC. And I gave you the OFAC search list if you wanted to do uh, manual searches for OFAC to make sure it's not a prohibited party. And just as an example, um, the last slide are the sanction programs that are in effect. This was, they updated all the time. Uh, the last time I checked it was the end of August. So these were the sanctions, the country sanctions in place at the time. Now it doesn't mean, you, you literally have to go and look at each of these sanctions to see what's prohibited. Sometimes a whole country would be sanctioned. You can't do business with Iran at this point, but other times they're specific requirements. You can't import or uh, export uh, micro devices to, you know, another country. So you need to look at these specific sanctions um, so individually. So it shouldn't anything in the United States? And it would only be certain countries outside? Not necessarily. Well, well, the country yeah. list, yes. But yeah. the OFAC list absolutely has uh, U.S. companies and U.S. individuals okay. and addresses on the list that you should check against. All right, so uh, at the end of my presentation, I thank you all for your attention. Uh, we have time or any questions, I will, uh, I'm here. And if there isn't, uh, feel free to email me. It's uh, loy.sarikin at gmail.com. All right, thanks very much. Anybody have questions in the room?
Uh, Justin, you have any questions from the audience? Uh, yeah, we do have a couple of questions from the audience. Oh, there? Yeah. I think I picked that one up. We had one with Al Jazeera radio oh. station, which was allowed. Yeah. Questions? Yeah, we have a couple here. Um, the first question is, um, is a check considered cash for money laundering purposes? And also the same question for a money order. Um, a check is not considered a cash equivalent. Um, a money order is. Now, generally it breaks along the lines of if, if it can be traced back to the individual who purchased it or gave the instrument, then it won't be necessarily considered a cash equivalent. So a check is coming from an account. The bank knows who that person is. It can be traced back with the account number. So that's why that's not considered a, a cash equivalent. A money order, though, I think, at least the last I knew, you could go into a bank. Uh, I don't even know if you have to show ID anymore, but you could just hand them cash and they'll give you a money order. So that would be considered a cash equivalent. All right, great. Um, another question we have here is, should a company's vendors also be checked to OFAC in addition to the check, in addition to checking customers? Yes. <laughs> that was, uh, that was a fight I had at, with several companies where they never did that before. Um, yeah, you absolutely should be doing that. So if you have a procure, procurement department, or any vendors, it's, it's a five minute thing to check them, you should. I'll remind you again, the, the law is um, a, conducting a transaction with a party on a list. So th there's no distinction made. A transaction's a transaction, whether you're on the buying side or the selling side. So that right. should absolutely be covered. All right, great. Um, we have another question here. What would you say is the most important piece of advice or biggest takeaway you could give to anyone from this presentation? Boy, I don't know. <laughs> um, I guess common sense hopefully will prevail, although I'm, I, that's why I was hesitating because as a lawyer and being involved with the law, a lot of times that doesn't work. And I'm always amazed <laughs> at what a judge or a jury will find in, in view of what would normally be common sense. But as credit managers, you know, if, if you think it doesn't look right, it smells bad, it, there's a red flag, if it just doesn't pass all these tests in your own common sense, that should tell you something to look further, to investigate, all right? Just, I, w I would kind of go with you common sense and, and let that guide you. Hopefully, uh, that'll work. <laughs> all right, um, I'm not seeing any more questions here, so uh, with that, I think we'll shut down the webinar. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone for taking the time out to come to listen to today's presentation, as well as thank Lloyd for putting on a, uh, a great presentation for us. Um, for anyone who didn't print out the uh, handout while they were in the presentation, I'll be emailing a copy to everyone. Um, and just to remind everyone else who's on the line, if you could take the 30 seconds to fill out the webinar uh, survey, that would be great. It really gives us a lot of great insight in how we can continue to make our webinars better for you. So with that, I'm going to shut us down. I hope everyone enjoys the rest of their day. Thank, Thank you. you all.